morning, good afternoon, good night, however you're watching, wherever you're watching, however you're listening, wherever you're listening. It is the Salute to Tro- Bet Online Salute to Troy podcast, and we got the tripod here. My bearded brother is back. Jamal shaved this morning, just in case you guys wanted to know. Jamal did shave this an morning. hour ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> hour ago, got some coffee. You know, a little bit of a shadow. We'll we'll go. we'll be there by the end of the show. I need a fresh mind up for Christmas, just to let you know. So, Ryan, you're look yours is looking good though. You you got the trimmers going. So yours is looking good. I'm jealous. Need a little trail on the stash, but yeah, it's uh mine though. Once it, the longer it gets, it starts like wave getting wavy. It's very bizarre. Mm. Oh, maybe you were, oh maybe you were meant to have golden wave golden wavy locks. Yeah, I mean I, I am Norwegian. It's that Viking in me, I guess. Oh, there that, you go. That, that bearded braid. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. We got Ryan and Jamal. Ryan, how are you doing? How's your traveling been? How's everything going? How's the family? Good. good, man. Family's good. We hit Baltimore. We we're in New York for 24 hours. Back to Baltimore, Philly. Now we're in Denver. So, you know, hitting all the stuff. Uh, this next week will be nice. We're just with the folks in Denver. So a little more mellow. See some old high school friends and uh, and then head back to L.A. for Christmas. So, but happy to uh, be on. A lot going on with SC. So we got a lot to get into. Definitely. And we got the math scientist itself, Jamal Madman Magdy. How are you doing today, Jamal? Doing well, Fred. Great to be on as always. We got the we got the bearded bandits in the house, and uh, we got all the the flux that's going on the the Trojan latte of all the of all the inputs and the outputs. Lots to talk about today. All right, that's good. That's exciting. So we're gonna jump into the roster. We're gonna jump into DBs. Hold on, wait. Never mind. There's a lot going on. Never mind the DBs. We'll get moving. <laughs> got you on that. Got you guys. You guys looked up like, wait, that's not what we talked about. <laughs> Keep us yeah, on. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, there are some DBs that we're going to be talking about, but yeah. it's not exclusively. Yeah, we had a whole conversation. I had a whole conversation before the show. Just to let you guys know, like, yeah. And then I hit him with that. I, you guys just saw your face. You guys. Like, what? <laughs> what <was going> <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. So <clears throat> the portal was live. The portal is live. I think the portal is more exciting than baseball free agency right now. I could be wrong, but the portal is going live right now. There's nothing to baseball free agency, Fred. I mean, Shohei's a Dodger. That's all we need to know. Uh, you know, that- everything else is just table stakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, there's still two more pitches out there that we can get, but we'll talk. That's a later conversation for a later date. <laughs> um, and we are Dodger fans, so if you're not a Dodger fan, unsubscribe. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> we need Maybe the subscriptions. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, so let's talk about who's going out, and let's address this. Um, for you guys who don't know, we talk a lot outside the podcast. We talk every day. I feel like we talk to each other more than we talk to our wives and our family at home. Like every time something pops up, our text messages are just blowing up. So we have a lot of interesting thoughts and different ideas. And I also want to, this time, I also want to see your comments. Just blow the comments up because this is a important conversation we need to get to. And it's going to be around the portal, right? So let's talk about who's leaving, right? We we just, so we talked about leaving first, right? I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. I already threw the trick on you guys. I just want to make sure. We say it on time. three right. leaving over the last 24 hours, basically. Yep. And so address that, Ryan. Let us know the big three leaving. So you got Malachi Nelson, five-star QB, leaving. Damani Jackson, five-star corner, leaving. And Tackett oh. Curtis, four-star linebacker, leaving. Right. And uh, um, you forgot one. Uh, I mean, others have left. I just mean the last Mario like, Williams. Mario, 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 Mario Williams. Mario Williams, yeah, yeah. yeah that, was like, that was like a few days ago, but yes. But yes, him too. Yeah, yeah. So let's just address it. We'll we'll go from I guess the top down. So top if we're looking at a bottle, small to big, right? Um Mario Williams, we discussed it with receivers. I said that Michael Jackson should leave. You guys are like, nah, he should stay. He's a Trojan at heart. If the guy was to leave, it should be Mario Williams. Mario Williams left. They're both leaving. <laughs> Michael Jackson the third left. Yeah. Oh, so Michael we were Jackson both right. The oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> so with that being said. There's no panic in the receiver room because there's a lot of youngsters that are still coming up, right? They're probably going to go get some receivers in the portal now because they have to fill some senior voids. But Mario leaving is a great example of why I think the portal was good. 
he was going to get lost in the wash. He was not going to be the guy this year. And this is just my opinion. These young kids were going to come and, and, and just pass Mario up. He was not going to be the guy. He has an opportunity to go somewhere else and be the guy, be the number one receiver, and do something great. I am 100% okay with that in the portal. When we talk about some of these guys leaving later down the portal, I think it's a little bit different. What are your thoughts real quick on Mario Williams? I think they're all about the same on Mario Williams here. We'll start with Jamal, and then after Jamal, you're done. We'll roll right into Ryan. We'll get, we'll tackle this one real quick. Go ahead, Jamal. Yeah, Fred. I mean, I think we had sort of predicted that Mario Williams, it was in his best interest to transfer a couple of weeks ago for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. I think he came into USC almost with a package deal with Caleb. I mean, it's sort of hard to believe that now uh, two seasons ago. But when you have the advantages of playing with the incumbent quarterback in terms of Caleb Williams at OU his freshman year, and you have the same head coach, and you understand the system, and yet you still couldn't quite break in to that solidified wide receiver one spot, or even in some cases that wide receiver two spot, now that that, that quarterback is no longer there, and you've got guys like a Zakaria Branch nipping at your heels and, and possibly having it also passed you, it really doesn't make sense to stay. He needs to go to a different environment where he can be more of a showcase player and showcase the speed, showcase the agility, his abilities on special teams, his abilities with the deep ball, and just really kind of round out, much in the ways that Relique Brown has done going to Arizona State. I think Mario Williams needs to find a similar situation. So it made all the sense in the world. And I'm glad he did it. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think there um, would have would have been fine to see him stay. Um, but yeah, it seemed like that room with those young guys we talked about. I mean, Jacoby Lane barely got any touches this year. And I think he's going to, like we said, explode next year. And and Zachariah Branch and all these other great guys. And, and I think they will probably bring one or two in the portal too. So um, probably in Mario's best interest, I'm sure. Uh, Lincoln Riley and other coaches maybe even sat down with him and maybe told him that. Like, hey, it's probably, you know, we want you here. But at the same time, like, it might be best for you to go somewhere where you can get a little more shine. Uh, to get to the NFL next year. Yeah, so at this point, we all agree. I, I, I guess we could say that. But no, I, I wish nothing but the best for Mario Williams. Great kid. He was a great contributor for what he has done, especially that first year, that come out year. I wish nothing for the best with him. I hope he goes somewhere and gets a great opportunity to play football and show what he could do and show his upside. So the next one that's out the door is Tackett Curtis. And it's kind of the same thing with Tackett Curtis. He had a great freshman year. Um, he was great up front, and as Jamal would tell us, those games up front were not great. Like anybody, I could go out there right now and play on those games up front. When it got for real, um, it was not his. He was not the best performer, and there was even times we were saying, "Uh, maybe Tackett Curtis shouldn't play. Maybe they should start going with Gentry and you know Mason Cobb." So, I think Tackett Curtis belongs in the Big Twelve. He's a Big 12 guy. Um, I can't see him in the SEC. I think he has more success in the Big 12. I don't, I'm don't. i not dreading the loss because I will tell you this, and this is only speculation, and I'm not reporting any news. For Tackett Curtis to leave, that means there's somebody coming in that's forcing him out, right? So they already got a linebacker, right, Ryan? Uh, right? They got a linebacker in the port already, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah which we'll talk about in a bit, but Easton Mascarenas Arnold came in right. from Oregon State. So they got a linebacker in the portal. There's also a linebacker out there that was at Oklahoma. That's the top linebacker in the portal, and I don't think he's picked a place yet. I don't remember his name per se, but he's still on the free agency market. I'm not for sure. So don't kill me if I'm wrong, but he's still on the market, I think. And I think they're hot on his trail too. So I think there's something that pushed Tackett Curtis out. He doesn't want to get lost in the wash. I don't think this is a money search. I think this is just an opportunity for him to play because he doesn't want to sit after he played the whole season. So same thing with him. I wish nothing for the best. But these are two kids, examples of the portal. Ryan, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, Tackett, I think it's you know it's tough to see because of the upside. And obviously being a freshman just from last year, just recruited, four-star, kind of surprised everyone, including me, that you know when the depth chart came out to start the year, he was the starter and kind of beat out some of those incumbents. You know, started that start, part of that may have been because Gentry was, you know, banged up to start the season, but he took that job and really 
you know, ran with it the whole season. And they had, we talked about it many times about the the kind of odd shuffling between all five backers. Um, but he was, was clearly one that they wanted to lean on. So when you see the kind of investment that they seem to put in, and I'm not talking money wise, I'm just talking playing time wise. Um, it seemed like a guy that they really believed in the ceiling that he could get to. Now, when you shuffle coaches on the defensive side of the ball, you know things and dominoes are going to fall. And you go and obviously you get Dan Lynn as a DC, but you bring over Matt Enns as the new linebacker coach. And, you know, this is, again, me just speculating, but, you know, he may have different philosophies, different what he looks for in backers. So I think that's one aspect of it. I'm sure there were conversations had. And then, like you said, with Easton um, Arnold coming in from Oregon State, you know, a great local kid from Mission Viejo, great career up at Oregon State. He comes down with his brother, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, so he's going to be jockeying for playing time or he probably will be the, the true starter. And and there's still, we don't know exactly what's going to go down with Gentry and Cobb, if they're going to declare for the draft or be back or Rayshon Davis. So, um, you know, they could have just been a numbers game when it comes down to it. So fun to see in terms of just the ceiling and just how young he was and how much we saw him play. Um, but I think because of the incoming transfer, because of the new coach at his position group, and because of um, a potential nether portal guy, like you said, coach, uh, it, it just became a numbers game. Yeah, go ahead, Jamal. Yeah, I think it's it's unfortunate because I think Tackett Curtis, more than anything else to me, was one of those culture guys where if he ended up staying three or four years at USC, he could have been a tremendous glue player across multiple recruiting classes and incoming classes and really establish a culture and identity, particularly on the defensive side of the ball and really kind of establish leadership in the locker room. But I think that Tackett Curtis is the first of many dominoes here where you're seeing a systemic change philosophically with USC defensively going into the 2024 season, and that is doing away with more of the smaller, quicker, more slender guys that are a little bit more agile, and they're transferring that over now to bigger, thicker, longer you know, bulkier guys. And I think you're you're starting to see the impact of the Anton Lin's defensive philosophy. I think Ryan talked about Enns uh, and others, but I think you're going away now from the slender, quicker sort of philosophy that the previous regime had to now bigger, more physical, wider guys. And I think Tackett Curtis just fit uh, too much of that previous regime and not enough of this new philosophy. So Really wish Taggart Curtis well. I think, to your point, Fred, he's going to have a really nice career no matter where he goes, whether that's it stays in the Big Ten, goes to the Big 12, wherever it may be. I think he's fundamentally very sound, extremely high IQ, extremely high motor, and I think does all the right things extremely well. But I think there is now a philosophical change that we're seeing with USC for better or for worse. But I think the Anton Lynn, when, especially when you look at kind of UCLA's backers last year, Tackett Curtis didn't really fit that mold. And so you're starting to see DeAnton Lynn's fingerprints all over talent acquisition on the defensive side. Before we continue, I want to let you guys know that today's podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is where the game starts. You want to get on those bowl games? They started last weekend. Jamal was at a bowl game and walked out there with a smile on his face. If you want to get in any parlay this weekend on the bowl game, go to betonline.ag, put a promo code BELIEVE, B L E A V, and get a 50% welcome bonus. Bet Online, where the game starts. <clears throat> All right. So now let's get to the crust of this thing. Let's talk about. The issue with the portal. Damani Jones enters the transfer portal. Right? Jackson. A kid with a kid with a huh? Jackson. Damani sorry. Jackson. Damani Jackson. I apologize. Damani Jackson. Answers the transfer portal. Kid with a ton of upside. A kid with a chance to compete. A kid who could have been very good. Thorpe Award finalist. That's my ceiling for Damani Jones. Big long body kid. Potential first round draft pick. A corner that you know could be really good. Enters the transfer portal. So the question is why? In my opinion, and what I think, I think he's money shopping. And then that becomes the problem with the portal and NIL. I think he's money shopping. I think he's going to try to find a better deal and see what he could do better. In reality of it, you didn't put very good film on tape. I mean, you didn't put, yeah, on the field, you didn't put very good tape out. There's a lot of, there's a play what you spin in a circle. There's a play what you, like, just lost completely. Majority of your film is you lost on the field. 
can a coach say, oh, I can fix that. The scheme is just too hard. Probably. But if I was to look right now, he's a group six guy. But his potential is power five first round draft pick, right? Long frame, big body, could cover. He, we've seen him do it. We've seen him do it against good teams. <clears throat> but it wasn't consistent. We see more blunders than we do see good coverage. I really think that this is a money grab. And it, it sucks because I don't I'm not trying to talk bad about them, but this is the issue we have with NIL, and this is the issue we have with Portal. You could also enter the portal when it's a money grab. Now, I also think it's another thing, too. I think that people are poaching players off of rosters. And I think Damani Jackson got poached and they told him to enter the portal. I don't know if it's his doing or if, if it's actually coaches actually poaching because we heard stories of both. If it's the latter, that's a lack of integrity. I have an issue with it. I don't see any reason for Damani Jackson to transfer. None at all. You're in the best situation possible. They got a new defense coordinator. They want to put you in a new place. They're, they're helping your defensive backfield. You should have been the pencil starter. There's no reason for you to leave. I'm not happy with this decision because, in my opinion, I think he's money grabbing. I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see any other reason for him to be like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get into the portal. That's just my opinion. Ryan, what do you think about it? I mean, my again, this is just my opinion too. I feel... <clears throat> Aside from defensive coaching changes, which we can harp on all the time, and Doug Belk being the new secondary coach out of Houston. Um, so maybe there was a conversation there. But to me, it was more of just he was a Dante Williams guy. I mean, he was recruited by Dante on Clay Helton's staff. When Clay Helton was fired, and I could have the timeline kind of wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong or anyone in the comments, feel free. But after Clay Helton was fired, he decommitted. And then once Lincoln Riley was hired and kept Dante Williams on staff, he recommitted came to USC. So, and then now obviously we know Dante Williams and USC parted ways just a few days ago, they bring in Doug Belk. And as soon as Dante Williams is gone within 24 hours, he hits the portal. So there's probably, I'm sure a lot of other situations into it. I don't like want to too much speculate. It could be money. It could be scheme. It could be whatever. To me, I just feel like he was a Dante guy recruited by Dante, loved playing for Dante. And once he was gone, he's like, I'm going to either follow Dante to Georgia or I'm going to go start a name for myself somewhere else. So I, that's just kind of what I see as huge as a Dante guy. Matt, man. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think that that really checks out. He, his, his attachment to Dante Williams was well-documented and very evident. And I think the moment, and, and I think that's also the interesting part about this whole process, right? Where you talk about transfer portal on the one side, but, when you have a complete overhaul of the coaching staff, you're going to get guys in that really align with that coaching staff. But there's also going to be a cost there that guys are going to leave who are very close to the previous coaching staff. And so you're just sort of witnessing that turnover right now. And I think Domani Jackson, I agree with you, Fred. I think there's a really nice situation here for him at USC to grow and build. You and I had an extensive conversation about the possibilities of a tantalizing secondary in 2024, and Domani Jackson and his growth was certainly a part of that. He is absolutely a phenomenal athlete at the cornerback position, and I think where the growth needs to happen is really from a skill standpoint, from learning his craft, from being able to understand footwork, being able to read uh, wide receiver body language and tendencies and really sort of hone in on what it means to be a great positional player because he's got all the physical tools. It's a matter of putting it all together. But this, to me, was really a case of Dante Williams uh, was the, the guy who was the reason he came to USC. He didn't come to USC because of USC or because of the history or because of the pedigree. He came for a particular individual that he built a relationship with. And now, by all indications, he's either going to follow Dante Williams there or most likely go to one of the, the other two finalists that were deep into consideration, one being Michigan and the other one being Alabama. So I probably think he's going to go to Alabama, given they kind of know how to coach corners over there too. Uh, but I think this was a case where he wants to go where he can rebuild a very close relationship with the coaching staff. I got, I didn't know that part. And if that part's true, that, that, that is a good reason. But I still would have not left. And let me tell you why. Just real quick. Because he might get drafted and they fire the coaching staff and you can't go anywhere. You're going to have to learn from right. that new coaching staff. And if you don't 
learn from that new coaching staff, you're going to get cut. You know what I mean? Like, like the next level is is a very cutthroat business. So I just think this would have been a good, true test of character for him to withstand it. And be like, you know what? I got a new coaching staff. At first, we butted heads, but it worked out for me, and I would have been a, I became a better person. That's just my opinion. That's how I'm looking at it from a coaching perspective. But I still wish him nothing but the best. I still think he's going to be great. I can't wait until I see him get drafted, so we can be like, I told you that kid was good. So like, there's no hard feelings for him. I just. Don't like the. I personally don't like the decision that he's making. Let's jump into our final one that's entering the transfer portal, and let's just jump into the roots of why the transfer portal is evil. Let's <laughs> jump into the roots of why the transfer portal and NIL are going to be the death of college football if they do not get the control over it. There's no reason for Malachi Nelson to leave, and we, I've seen this multiple places. He's never been healthy. He has a bad shoulder. I don't know the extent of the injury, but he's never been healthy, and that's one of the reasons why he probably didn't get as much playing time as we expected him to get because he has a shoulder issue. <clears throat> Malachi Nelson jumping in the portal. I, you could say it's Dante. You could say it's this. You could say it's that. No college in the universe. No college in the history of university athletics has more Heisman Trophy winners at quarterback. Quarterback U is in Los Angeles, California, and downtown LA. Point. Prove me wrong. Show me somewhere else where there's multiple quarterbacks as one Heisman's. You know what I mean? Like, prove me wrong, and I'm willing to see it. But I can name you Carson Matline or Caleb Williams right now. You know what I mean? John David Booty, he wasn't great, but he holds a Rose Bowl record for most touchdowns. People know who Matt Castle are. You're in LA in a very, you're in an LA where the market is actually favorable towards you. You could be on every billboard. You could be on every commercial. You are in Hollywood. The reason for him leaving, to me, I think it's a 100% money grab. I think that maybe the nail didn't come through like he wanted to. Maybe he wanted a raise, and this is just all speculation. But if I was to sit down and ask him legit, why are you leaving? It can't be because of playing time, because the next question I'll ask him, well, how's your shoulder? You know what I mean? Like, how's your shoulder? Well, you know, okay, next. Here's your chance now. Go compete. Even though we're bringing it, go compete. Be be a player. Go show me that you're a five-star. I don't mind putting Sam Howard on the bench if you're better than him, right? Where can you, where can he possibly go? And everybody will be like, well, he's a five-star and this and that. I don't care. The, fi- the film that he has out of the games he played are not great. We've seen him play at a college level. And it wasn't great. And I'm not taking, we know he has upside. We know he has a chance to be good, but he needs to be healthy. He's going chasing Neil. And chasing Neil and the portal is going to be the death of college football. If they don't control it, we now have the Wild West where people are unhappy and saying that they want money. And if they don't get the money, they just bounce. That's the death of college football. And that's going to cause a whole lot of problems. And it's going to kill culture. Everywhere, all the way from Texas A&M, who's a cult, to Florida, Alabama, and no matter where it is, if you start chasing money, you're not going to be happy. And go to a university where it feels like home, where you have a great support, where you have a great network, and where you have great culture. And there's very few of those universities, and he had, had an opportunity at one of these universities where he could have been the face of L.A., but he's wanted to chase the dollar. In reality, the dollar would have came if he would have just stayed patient and earned his starting spot. So that's my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's what I think happened. Jamal, I'm going to go to you first on Malachi Nelson. Go ahead. Yeah, Fred, I mean, really well said. This is such a puzzling one because when you take a step back, you know, more than even USC being quarterback, you Lincoln Riley is the quarterback whisperer, right? I mean, I think we've all been critical – of Lincoln Riley's decisions or his strategies or his way of potentially building an organization, building culture. But the one thing that is unanimous that everyone recognizes with Lincoln Riley is the fact that he is a quarterback whisperer and a quarterback guru. He's had three Heisman winners. And his fourth prodigy at quarterback, Jalen Hurts, is in the running for NFL MVP right now. So if anyone understands quarterbacks, it's Lincoln Riley. So to be at the program that you you have that coach, um, you know, that's an inherent advantage, number one. Number two, 
when you look at the landscape of the position for USC going into 2024, we all love Miller Moss. We think he's a terrific Trojan, all-time Trojan in terms of values and culture and the Trojan family and all of that. But if you are the five-star recruit, if you are the number one quarterback out of your class from Los Alamitos, you're not really worried about Miller Moss beating you out. You know you have that advantage in any sort of a rep, in any type, sort of a spring situation. Even if a Will Howard comes in 2024, it's only for one year. He's only got one year of eligibility, and you have another three years of eligibility to be able to win the job. So playing time opportunity, the road was paved. The coach, the road was paved. Then when you talk about playing in Los Angeles, playing for USC, a blue blood, playing in Los Angeles, where all of the opportunities for endorsements are there, where being the quarterback of the USC Trojans is one of the glamour positions, not only in all of college football, but in all of sports. And when all of that is set up for you and you decide to get up and walk away, you have to wonder that this really wasn't an on-the-field decision. Because if you're just logical, on the field, you're really set up for success. And so what could it be? It could be one of two things. And none of us really know what it is, but we're just sort of breaking down this argument logically. One is, to your point, Fred, that he's looking for more nil money. And the nil money uh, that USC is providing is pales in comparison to what other schools can provide. Or USC promised a certain amount and now has retracted on that amount. And that's kind of caused him to open up and look elsewhere. Or B, that his relationship with Lincoln Riley has eroded in some way. And when you talk about Lincoln has sort of talked about Malachi in recent press conferences, He's been a little vague. I mean, he's been political. He's been polite, but he hasn't really been necessarily effusive of praise. It's been, hey, Malachi's kind of struggled physically. You know, we're looking for the growth. We're looking for the learning. But he hasn't kind of gotten that stamp of approval and that endorsement from Lincoln. So that could be something that behind the scenes, maybe that relationship has eroded a little bit and Malachi feels like he needs a change of scene. So it has to be either financial or it has to be interpersonal. Because on the field, uh, it really doesn't make a lot of sense for Malachi Nelson to leave this situation. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys, I think we're all in agreement. Um, And you guys said it really well, so I'll just kind of add to it. You know, we've heard that that he is unhappy with his NIL, whether that means promises weren't met or whatever. Um, But we know his he's repped by Clutch Sports Group and Rich Paul. I mean, he is the modern day, like, professional athlete at USC ref by one of the most powerful sports groups here in Los Angeles. And so if they're making demands for money, not being met, they're going to push their client to go get where the money's made. And so I think there's definitely a play where he's, you know, whatever you want to call it, going for the bigger opportunity and money going, chasing the money, whatever. I don't, I don't know the kids. I don't want to tear him down and that it's his decision. Um, but there's another part of this that I think is interesting. And this is, this is just, I, I don't know anything. I'm just saying just to further the conversation when you hit the portal, and, you know, in the portal, you can kind of, especially when you're repped by clutch sports groups, you can kind of make demands for money, right? And you can almost make a demand if someone's paying you $1 million, $1.5 million, that you're going to be the starter at there. Like, they're not going to come pay you, especially if it's a smaller program, and then not start you. Now, I'm not saying that's happening, but at SC... I agree with you. The path was there for him to start either next year or at the very latest in 25, but there was still going to be some competition there. And by all accounts of what Lincoln Riley said, he was going to be with their Moss. And obviously if Will Howard comes in, there's going to be competition there. So maybe he's also seeing it as a bargaining chip. Like I can go make more money somewhere else and also use that bargaining chip that, Hey, you're paying me. And in my whatever contract, I'm your starter. And I don't need anyone looking over my shoulder. I'm your guy starting day one as a, you know, incoming sophomore in a 24. So no idea that's the case. I think it's, it's definitely mostly a problem with NIL at USC, something that the university and all the collectives are working to get better and stronger. But I think it's, that's what led to the erosion and why he is moving on. And so this is, this, this is, this is where you have to have hard conversations and we're going to have this hard conversation. If I give you 1.5 million and you're not showing any progress, it's time to have a conversation. What am I paying you $1.5 million for? And I got another kid that's up on the run. What does Zach Branch deserve now? You know what I mean? Like, what are, what are all these people who are going to – all these freshman receivers that are going to be good, what do they deserve? Hold on. Well, Malachi Nelson's holding up our money. You've got to have a hard conversation. That's the reality of life. 
that's a part of being an adult. <laughs> like you need to perform to make this money and you're not performing. You know what I mean? And it's not just USC. It needs to be like that with every university. Like, why am I going to tie up this money on a guy that's not really that good? We need to renegotiate your money. You know, and now that's why I said there needs to be terms and limits on these things because we're getting into the Wild West here. Like, it's getting, it's going to get bad sooner than it gets better. But by the time they put rules on it, it's going to be too late. And that's the NCAA's problem. They they wait too late by the time the rules are on it, and then all of a sudden they're trying to fix it, and it's unfixable. Now's the time to put the rules on it. Hey, this class, if you're this if you're this year in school, you can cap off at this amount of money. If you're this year in school, you cap off on this amount of money. If you're transferring, you get this much up front, and then it's based on it's based on performance. If you guys want contracts, we're going to give you contracts. Because guess what? At the next level, the contract there's contracts that you have to perform to make that money. If you don't perform, they'll cut you and take the cap hit. Then you get no money. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, is it, man, like, that's the problem be, with giving. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'll be honest. Like, I was very naive when NIL first passed, whatever it was, three, four years ago now. Um, and, you know, we knew that there was not a lot of caps on it. We, was, we didn't know what it would be. But... To me at the time, I was like, oh, this is great. You know, now kids can earn based on, you know, getting Gatorade commercials. And, you know, if, if some boosters, the owner of a electric store, they can get him to do like electronic ads and stuff. Like I didn't know this quickly, we'd be in a full on free agency, pay to play negotiation contracts with representation. Like it is wild where we are, how quickly we got here. And I was naive. I didn't see this coming this quickly. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to interject, but I just, cause you were saying it's like, they need to get under control. Cause it's, it, I mean, at this point it's what it's going to be until some restrictions get made. Yeah, no, I, it's, I it's such you. a real, it's such a good point, Ryan. I mean, it really just comes down to again, and I think we've said it now for a couple of shows and I, I want to kind of keep beating the point there. It really just comes down to how many seven figure donors you have. That's going to make up your collective. We can talk about the X's and O's on the field. We can talk about the coaches. We can talk about the personnel. Ultimately, that is the engine that's going to make this whole thing go. And I think what makes Malachi in particular is such a fascinating case study, Ryan, to your point earlier, he was rep by Clutch Sports. And who is Clutch Sports? Yeah, it's Rich Paul, but it's LeBron James. And yeah. who else is rep by Clutch Sports right now? Bronny James. And Juju Watkins, who is the superstar women's basketball player at USC. All three kind of were a package deal together with Clutch Sports as they sort of deployed nil together. And in many ways, they were this very unique fiscal marketing bundle that Clutch Sports is really using as a case study to generate as much value as possible. And so the fact that Malachi not only is leaving USC in terms of the on the field, but it's sort of leaving the bundling that comes with Clutch and the fact that Bronny is there and LeBron's at the games and Juju Watkins and all of that really indicates to you that Malachi isn't getting the money that either he expected or he was promised. Because even to your earlier point, Fred, it's not like he didn't perform. He redshirted. He was hurt. He's sort of working his way through, growing into his body. I don't think anybody expected him to play this past season with a reigning Heisman Trophy winner coming back. So there's really no performance degradation in any way, shape, or form. So it's not even like his brand has soured or any sort of negative publicity. None of that has taken place. He's still sort of clean. I mean, he's sort of in, it's like a doll that's still in the package, right? Like nothing has happened. You know, that value is still there in a, in a pristine way. So the fact that he's willing to break up that bundle break up sort of that business arrangement and ignore the on the field advantages that come longer term with that sort of area under the curve really tells you that it's about getting paid and it's about getting paid now. And if you're not in a position to, to pay these kids top dollar, they're just going to go elsewhere. And now we're in a world where you need enough money to pay for coaches you need enough money left over to have a growing collective that grows every year. This is no longer as simple a model as just kind of donating for one purpose. You need money for coaches. You need money for the collective. You need money for facilities. This is really now turning into big business 
And I think of what Florida State was was doing a couple months ago when they were literally talking to J.P. Morgan Chase and other private equity institutions to sort of fund their collectives. I mean, this is where we are, where the world of Wall Street and the world of college football have come together and have come together extremely quickly, and there's really no sign of letting up. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because it takes away the college game. And what I mean by that, a a great example is all the bowl games that came on this weekend. Those kids who aren't getting a lot of collective, and they're just playing because they're playing their heart out. I watched the Stack Bowl Friday night. Those kids played their ass off, boy. I watched the D2 National Championship. Even though it was a blowout, they played their ass off. I watched the group of six bowl games this past Saturday, and they're just out there playing for the love of the game. You add that money to it. It just takes away the love. There's nothing. It's like they're not working to nothing. Like, the goal used to be, I need to get to the pros to get paid. Now they're like, well, shh. I made I made fifty million in college. I don't even have to go pro. I put enough money away, let it grow in the bank on a high yield savings account, or build a trust, give a house to my family. I'm good. You know what I mean? Like it, it just takes away. So hopefully it doesn't ruin the college game. So speaking of college game, you guys will watch the ball games this week. Stop by your local vendor, get you a Stone Brewery fight on Pell. They're at all your local vendors. Get you one today. Stone Brewery fight on Pell. Fight on. All right, let's flip the page. Let's go with the positive reinforcement now. <laughs> you always go to the negative, and you bring it back with positive reinforcement. That's leadership one on one. If anybody doesn't believe me, it's in all the books. So let's bring in the positive reinforcement. So, Deanton Lane and Lincoln Riley are just scouring the nation. They're trying their best to get this roster right. Lincoln Riley's motivated. Deanton's Lynn motivated. They have a whole new coaching staff, or they have a whole new coaching staff coming in. I'm interested to see what they do with uh, Nua and what's the other coach name that was the line Barry Odom, right? I'm interested Odom, to see yeah. what happens. I'm interested to see what happens with them because nothing's came out about them yet. So we'll wait yeah. and see what what happens there. But they're working hard. I'm not taking anything from them. They seem motivated. Um, so as Jamal said before the show, input and output. Let's talk about the input. We got the Arnold brothers coming from Oregon State. We mentioned them earlier in the show. Michigan Viejo kids. They were recruited. Not that they're Oregon State, what, about three-star athletes per se. Um, but they get to come home. They get to play at home very well. Oregon State's very good football team. In fact, I just got into an argument with a Michigan State fan saying, you guys are a basketball school and you're expecting to win a football national championships. You're going to be disappointed every year. So, like, you need to understand where the priorities are, are in that organization. We have Coach, the same. Why are, you, why are you bringing up UCLA? You know, <laughs> this was a Michigan State guy. Like, I know. I know. I'm, teasing you. <laughs> I know, I'm about to say, like, I, I've had this conversation. Like, you need to understand it's Izzo and then everybody else. Like, <laughs> there's a peck, there's level to this, man. But that coach at Oregon State did a really good job. Very good co- football. Very well coached football program. I hope those guys bring some of those values to USC. And when I say some of those values, like we're the underdog. Nobody believes in us. We're going to play with effort. And the only way you could beat us is talent. But effort beats talent 99% of the time, right? So one's a corner and one's a linebacker. Correct DB me if I'm wrong. and backer, yeah. Oh, DB and a backer. So we have another backer coming in. I still think that that backer from Oklahoma is coming. I'm just saying, I, he's still out there. I think he's coming. But if he does, yeah, if he does, that's pretty good. Let the nation and tackles all that. But those two come in. They're playing at home. They're a little bit more comfortable now. They're not. They could see mom, get a home cooked meal. But like I said, if they bring those values, that hard work, hard work, hard work. Let's play hard. Just play. Let's play your ass off. You'll win. I think they instill that into the defense with the Anton Lane because we saw what he did with UCLA. They played their ass off too. So I think this is a good fit for USC. Only problem, the only worry I have, slight worry, and they could prove me wrong, and I hope they prove me wrong. I hope there isn't a talent discrepancy because it still is Oregon State. So I'm hoping that their talent is good enough to keep up with the Michigans and the Ohio States of the world and the LSUs because they're opening up with LSU. So I'm excited they're here. I hope they bring them effort and keep building in the depth of that defense. Bigger guys. These guys are bigger, you know, because they're going to the code to playing bigger guys. So I like this move. Ryan, what do you think about it? 
Yeah, I love it. I mean, when you look at when you here's what I've loved, and I'd love to get just get your thoughts overall, both you guys, on kind of this defensive transformation. I feel like we haven't three talked all in unison. Either I've been out or we've had different conversations. But I think when the year ended and Lincoln Riley talked about what they wanted to do on defense. For the most part so far, they're kind of checking each box. Like they they got the – Deontay Lynn obviously was a D.C., but then when they talk about experience, you bring in Doug Belk, who was a D.C. at Houston. You bring in Mike Entz, who was the uh, – Matt Entz, excuse me, who was the head coach in D.C. and North Dakota State. So you get the experience there. They're getting bigger in the trenches. And then when you look at this experience that these two Arnold brothers bring and also when you look at physical defenses of the Pac-12, you think of Utah and you think of Oregon State. And going to the Big Ten, you got to have that physical defense. No more of this finesse speed. Obviously, you want speed still, but physical size is what it's all about. And so to emulate with some of those players coming in, what Oregon State was able to do, you have the experience of the coaching staff that Lincoln Riley said today at practice, they're still not done building. So it sounds like there still be will be more guys coming in. Um, but you get these two Arnold brothers. And, you know, Achille Arnold at DB was all Pac-12 defense. And what's crazy <laughs> this is a different conversation, but with how bad this USC defense is right now, as it stands, if Kalen Bullock comes back, they have three all pack 12 defense guys in this roster with Kalen Bullock and uh, Bell Alexander and now Akili uh, Arnold. So um, yeah, I love these two guys joining. I think they'll bring a tenacity. They'll bring experience. Like you said, mission Viejo kids, um, uh, but both four star transfer portal transfers. So, so raised up in the rankings there and um, they'll right. just add some good competition. I think to both rooms. Go ahead, man, man. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a big fan here. I, I think this was the big win so far in the offseason. And what I love about these two guys, again, is the physicality. And I think Ryan talked about it. I think the big prize out of the two is actually Easton Mascarenas Arnold. Because yeah. when you look at him, very unique body type for a backer. You know, when you talk about a guy who's 5'11", but 285, you don't really put that height and weight usually together. And then when you put that height and weight together, you don't really expect to get kind of end-to-end production uh, laterally all over the field. And when you look at his year this year for Oregon State, which was right there with Utah and UCLA as the most physical defenses in the Pac-12, you're talking about 106 tackles, 49 solo tackles, two sacks, two interceptions. He was really all over the field. And then when you sort of couple that with Akili Arnold, who's 5'11 as well, just like his brother, but he's 200 instead of 285. More of a physical presence at the cornerback and defensive back position. And I think for me, Arnold is going to bring a toughness that was lost with Blackman last year. You know, that was the one role that SC didn't quite recover from last year and wasn't talked about a lot was Makai Blackman and just how he would kind of get into receivers, compete, go head-to-head, disrupt use his hands, use his hips, and really kind of get into guys and play more bump and run coverage. And Arnold is a guy that's going to compete night in and night out. When I think of both these Arnold brothers, look, outside of the Notre Dame game last year, what was Caleb Williams' worst performance of his career? It was year one at Oregon State when he was 17 for 36, 180 yards, and that touchdown to Addison at the very end. I mean, those two Arnold brothers played a seminal role in shutting down that USC offense two years ago uh, in Corvallis. And it was Arnold Achille on the the wide side, kind of shutting down, bodying up Jordan Addison, bodying up Mario Williams, really disrupting those passing lanes. And it was Easton Mascarenas Arnold sort of flying sideline to sideline. But what I love about him is he's a guy that you can put in the box as well. You know, he's a guy that's going to cover tight ends. He's a guy that's going to sort of fly end to end. So there's just so much versatility there with that 5'11", 285. I think these two guys are going to anchor. The only shame is that they're only here for one year. And so, Fred, hopefully the other guys kind of really adopt uh, their blue-collar attitude, their underdog attitude, and it's a sponge that carries over beyond this one year. But I think these guys are going to be two anchors. And particularly in that secondary, if Kalen Bullock does decide to come back, you're going to have a really nice duo there with Bullock and Arnold. Um, So very excited about this. I think this is the big prize of the offseason. I know there's been a lot of conversation on who's coming out, who's coming in, what's the grade right now for USC's offseason. But I think all of the positivity begins with these Arnold brothers, and I think they're going to play a huge role 
in the 24 season. Even if Caleb Bullock doesn't come back, we got somebody that can replace him. We just need him to go ahead and sign the dotted line. Come on over. You know who I'm talking about, Jamal. Come yes, on over. Randy? KR. KR. Come on, yeah. <laughs> Come on over. Come on Heck over. Yeah, hey, Zion Branch is, is getting the wings too, if he can be healthy. Yeah, and they're, they're looking at John Humphrey as well. I mean, so there, there's a lot going on for sure. Yeah. Oh, Come yeah. on over. We'll take him. So, and you know what's the good thing about this? And I don't know for sure. See, like, you get a, a feeling, and I'm kind of going to go back to this in a, 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 real quick. You get a feeling if it's coming to play for an opportunity or if it's a money grab. This dude's coming to play. You know what I mean? Like, these, they, both of these dudes are coming to play. So, like, it, they, I don't see this so much as a money grab. I think, like, we're going to get that hard work and dedication, and he gets to come home. Like, that's the best thing. Like, I get to come home and play, and my, my parents can see me every home game and even vegas right it's a 45 minute flight to vegas so i love it i love both of the both of these guys are coming two big bodies you know and that replaces damani damani jackson right we got a big body for a big body so that works and the one um, thing i'll say fred about Achille arnold just to sort of put a final point on it even if you assume there's no improvement defensively you know now the gasps start you know god forbid but even if you assume that schematically, personnel-wise, for whatever reason, it's going to take DeAnton Lynn a year to sort of adjust. I don't believe that'll be the case. I think we'll see drastic improvement defensively. But even if you believe they're flat from the 23 season, what a guy like Achille Arnold brings, particularly in that secondary, is a physicality and a tenacity that opens you up for the turnover game once again. Because that was the big piece that was missing between 22 and 23. Look, 22's defense was structurally flawed it, as much, if not worse, than the 23 defense. But the one thing that defense was able to do was generate takeaways. And they were yep. able to do that because they were able to disrupt the timing and the the sort of the reality of every play. And that's what a guy like Achille Arnold can bring to the table. And then that's also what Easton Mascarenas Arnold can do in a variety of ways, whether that's ripping the ball out of players' hands in run stopping, whether that's sort of stripping guys from behind, whether that's kind of going sideline to sideline and really disrupting plays and getting folks behind the chains that then sets up a turnover. You're bringing guys in that even if all else stays the same, you're going to become more opportunistic defensively, and that alone is going to create some improvement in 24. You know what my number one philosophy is as a defense coordinator? create opportunities one more opportunity for the offense there you go if i create one more opportunity for the offense i have a chance to win the game you know what i mean like i just want to create one more opportunity so um that, that's that's that uh, that's all. and so that's why the first year they were so good because they had 16 turnovers right and they were in the negative and they gave caleb williams so many opportunities this year no opportunities in, and there's a, a turnover problem on the on the defense so um, that's, that's, if they, if we could get that done, we have a very good chance, like you said, of being way better and you put a Miller Moss in a better situation too. So that's another thing that you have to think about. So jumping on to coming in and man, I am, this is interesting. This is interesting because Lincoln Riley has a very high success rate at quarterback. And when I tell you very high, very high, right? Right now, Jamal, we're going to have you do the math in your head. Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, Caleb Williams. Am I missing one? Four Spencer, to uh, Spencer Rattler. Four right? out of five. Four out of five were successful. What's that percentage? 80. 80% success rate. Simple. Simple math. I, I, I thought I was going to name off a lot more. So, and then, and then, if you really want to get down to it, Cliff is still on staff. Johnny Menzel, Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of, a lot of quarterback gurus there. Will Howard committed to USC. And a lot of people say Will Howard does not fit at USC. I would disagree because this is a kid that was recruited by Lincoln Riley. This is a kid that has his film watched by Lincoln Riley extensively. 
and he thought that this was the guy to go get. I'm not sure if Cam Ward has committed anywhere yet. Do we know? No, not yet. Has, not, even not Howard, as of yet. As I don't of even, now, Howard's not a official official, but it's like yeah. 100% prediction he will. And then also, oh, so he hasn't committed yet? I thought they said he Not committed. officially. It was, not it's close. officially. It's like all the outlets are 100% predicting it. He's committing to SC, but which we means can, it's we not can 100%. Run. We can, yeah. <laughs> because we know how accurate the outlets are. <laughs> well, yes. even if Will Howard's a guy, I'm still going to go on what we're going to talk about. If I'm wrong, forgive me. Um, Will Howard is built different from all the quarterbacks that Lincoln Riley has had. His tallest, I think, was Caleb Williams at 6'2. You know what I mean? Maybe Jalen Hurts was about 6'2. But Jalen Hurts was bigger, but Baker Mayfield's smaller than most. We know Kyler Murray is a little guy, right? Spencer Rattler's not that big. Will Howard's a big guy, 6'4", 240, right? 242. Yeah, 242. Like big Ben. <laughs> but he can move, he can run. Uh, 10 rushing touchdowns. Lincoln Riley sees something in this quarterback that can make him special. And I'm going to put it on record right now. If Lincoln Riley gets this kid to work, right? If we don't get him benched and Miller Moss ends up playing the season, which is always the outcome, which is low percentage. I'm just saying that's the worst possible. But if, if SC is successful and I'm talking successful, big 10 championship, like top four playoff seed, Will Howard's going to win the, win the Heisman trophy. Because you're, when you're six four two fifty, 250, you don't do what you do, what, what we're going to see in Lincoln Riley's offense. I don't predict pocket passing. I predict him running. I predict him doing all the same things that all the quarterbacks prior to Will Howard has done. This is going to be very interesting and very fun. Very interesting and very fun. There's something that he likes about this kid. That's why he wants him. This is going to be great. The fact that, man, it's going to be Jamal's going to be hard to fire him if he has if he has a if he has a bad year in 2025, because in three years, he'll have two Heisman Trophy winners. <laughs> like, that's going to be tough. Like, you can't tell. There's nothing you could tell me that says he's not a Heisman Trophy winner. And I, I'm, I'm talking undefeated, one loss, bad day. Why, why else would he not be the Heisman Trophy winner? Because in, in, in Lincoln Riley's offense, that means he's doing some amazing stuff, putting up big yards, Big touchdowns, a lot of points. Who, who, what, like, who else would be able to do that? You know what I mean? So like, statistically, he's going to be way up there with his frame, his stature, and his quote unquote style. That's my opinion. I'll, I'll let's go. I'll throw it to Ryan. I'll let Jamal reflect on that. I want that to boil a little bit in Jamal. Ryan, what do you think about this little Howard thing? Yeah. I and mean, we talked to about quarterbacks, what, a week ago when we did our, our show yeah. and then fits and, um, you know, I, I think we said it there. Like it, it's, it'd be, re- it's going to be really fun to see if it comes to fruition just because of the size difference, because of a little bit, what he can do different inside the pocket. Um, th- the fact, I think the, the big, I think benefit of getting a Will Howard is he's played in some of these, you know, ground and pound grinded out games in the snow. Obviously a lot of the famous pictures go, not famous, but the pictures that all the outlets are using right now are the snow game and whatever. So he's been in those situations that, you know, there's going to be some muddy, ugly games in the big 10 next year, most likely, especially with the kind of rebuild this team is doing um, in certain phases of the game. So I think the fact that he's done that um, bodes well for this offense for Lincoln Riley. And then to your point, yeah, if he's able to lead this team and, and, go to a big 10 championship and, and puts up, you know, three 3,500 plus yards and, and, you know, gets the touchdowns and has some highlight level plays and, and, you know, big wins against say Notre Dame and LSU and Michigan. Like, yeah, why not? I mean, why wouldn't he be? I mean, there's no reason why he wouldn't be um, if this team is, you know, at the end of the dance, I think any quarterback that leads a team towards the end is, is always at least in the conversation. We see every year that that's the case. Jalen, you know, Milrow at Alabama was in the conversation late in the year and, and even we saw how he started. So as long as your your team's at the end there and you have at least uh, 
competitive numbers, you're going to be in the conversation. And if he goes above and beyond that and what we think he can probably in Lincoln Riley's system, then yeah, why not? Why not have your second Heisman Trophy at USC in three years? Madman, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, It'll be fascinating to see Will Howard at, at 6'5", 240 be in this version of the air raid with Lincoln Riley. I, I definitely think there's elements there where he plays a little bit faster than his frame. I think he's his release is, is quite quick. So those are some things where it, it very much aligns with sort of an air raid system. But one thing I'll say, Fred, is we talked about four out of five. I don't know if Will Howard is is part of the denominator because I think it goes back to our original conversation. When you look at the type of success that Lincoln Riley has had in the past with the names that you mentioned, Mayfield, Murray, Williams, Hertz, and you look at Cam Ward, Cam Ward is a mirror image physically and stylistically of so many of those players. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And clearly Lincoln Riley has shown an ability to rinse and repeat year after year with that style of quarterback in this type of system. And so the fact that it is Will Howard as opposed to Cam Ward, I don't know if it's so much Lincoln Riley wanting to think more outside of the box or it's a situation where SC just doesn't have the nil for Cam Ward. And I think that we're probably in a situation, the pragmatist in me says, this is more plan B. And Lincoln Riley has done a really nice job of going to Will Howard early, making sure he's got kind of a plan B, a close hold on plan B, in the event he doesn't get the real guy that he wants that perfectly aligns with his system. Because I have a hard time believing Lincoln Riley, after coming off of a 7-5 and five year where he's lost three consecutive games, lost a ton of the goodwill that he built in year one, lost a ton of the faith of a lot of the fan base, is going to use year three at USC where he's already got eight losses. He only had 10 losses in five years at Oklahoma. And he's going to use that year to think outside the box and come up with a variant of his offense. If anything, he is going to want to be hungry to sort of go back to the recipe that has worked for him and made him successful and got him the three Heisman winners and got him the $100 million contract in the first place. So to me, the fact that USC is so close to Will Howard tells me that, yes, I think it's going to be intriguing to watch Will Howard in this system. And I think Will Howard has the ability to succeed in this system. But I don't think Will Howard was plan A in this system. And I think it's more revealing of USC's finite amount of nil more so than anything from a Da Vincian perspective of Lincoln Riley. Let me play devil's advocate. What if it was? What if, and just hear me out, what if Cam Warren was plan A, right? And now you got Malachi Nelson gone and you have Damani Jackson gone, right? And now you got Mario Williams gone, Michael Jackson III gone. You need a little bit more money to fill in some spaces. So the money that you were going to pay Cam Ward no longer makes sense compared to the money you were going to pay Will Howard because now you have leftover money to replace the Mario Williams and Michael Jackson the third. What if that works out better financially for the program? You're still getting a talented quarterback, but you also have to fill in more spaces than expected two weeks ago when we had this conversation. What if that's a possibility? No, I, I think that's absolutely saying. right, Fred. I think that's that's financially very responsible and I think makes a ton of sense. Why pay one guy, let's play round numbers, why pay one guy $2 million when I can pay another guy 800000 or a million and have a million, a million, two left over to pay a bunch of other guys? I think it completely makes sense. But it goes back to that original point that we had, Fred, where this isn't 15 years ago. This isn't 10 years ago. When you talk about USC having infinite money and they can just buy anything that they want, now we're in a world where even USC has to watch its budget. Okay, this is the wild world of nil where you're no longer the richest and the baddest on the block, no matter who you're talking to. So the fact that we're even having fiscally responsible conversations says that there is a finite amount at the end of the well. It's not a bottomless pit. And so if it were a bottomless pit and money truly was no object here and you were throwing the kind of cash that a Bama is or an LSU is or a Texas is, 
then absolutely, you're going with Cam Ward. I have a hard time believing if Lincoln Riley had all the resources at his disposal that he wouldn't go for the prototypical quarterback that has created him three Heisman winners in a year that he desperately needs a winner because he's facing adversity for the first time in his collegiate career. Yeah. I know how to get I know how to get the bottomless pit back. In the words of the great Al Davis, just win, baby. <laughs> JWB. <laughs> yeah, you just hey, SC starts rolling again. I like I like I said the last show, and I don't know if you saw this or not, Ryan. My years at SC at every halftime, there was a check presented. Not just any check. There was millions and millions, hundreds of million dollars presented every single halftime, right? So it, there's a possibility, and it's out there. Where SC is like, we're from Missouri. Show us. We're not going to put all this in and nothing. I could put my money, like Jamal said, I could go invest in a property. I could do this, and, and that's just California. So I agree. But this thing starts rolling again. We start getting the 25 seven, seven figure donors, right? We start getting those guys real easy, but we have to show them. But we have to show. Are, is, or is the investment worth it? And that's on all Lincoln Riley, right? So that's the best way to go. You guys got anything else before we wrap this thing up? It's been a good hour. I, I appreciate this. I knew it was going to be a good one. This been this hour got away from us. You guys all got good. anything else? You're I'm good. A lot to talk oh, about. Always great. Absolutely. We could go for another hour. No, no, no. We- Let's not scare <laughs> the viewers. You know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I was about to throw another scenario out, but I don't know if my voice would hold up. So we'll, we'll save that maybe for next week. Or next you week. can draw it if you want on the whiteboard. You, you know, you on wanna, a piece you, of paper. <laughs> we want to get a pictionary. You, you, you want to give a cliffhanger for next. <laughs> you want to give a cliffhanger for next week, or you think we'll find? We'll probably we probably won't do DBs until after the portal closes. I'm just being honest with you. So much stuff comes. Yeah, well, Wednesday. Week. Wednesday's letter of intent day. Wednesday. So. That's oh, I was supposed to take that day off. Eric oh, I'll be. Up, a, I'll, I'm working from home. I'm working from. I'm working from home. All right. See, see if all, anyone who owns a business is watching our show, this is why return to office is important. Because look yes. at Fred's reaction. He said, "Oh, I'm working from home," as if that was synonymous with taking the day off. Okay, that's <laughs> why people are mailing it in in their pajamas at home. You know, having nice coffee and popcorn and lattes and candy and all of this stuff. So, if you're running a business and watching this, get your folks back in the office. You know, hey, please, don't been, tell please don't tell me, working, guys. Please don't I've tell been working me. from home since last. Wednesday, and I've been in Baltimore, New York, and now Denver. So. <laughs> definitely, Absolutely. definitely, that's perfect, Ryan. We, we, I, you remember the plan was for us to just go all day. Let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Uh, looks like me and Ryan might have something to do on Wednesday. He'll, uh, what's the phrase? I'll let you know. Yeah. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> so that yeah. means Fred will we'll see him on Thursday. Okay. So. Okay. You know. <laughs> Until next time, um, also, he'll also let us know about San Diego. We'll be down in San Diego. Me and Ryan be down in San Diego for sure. Jamal is debating if he wants to go play Slumdog Millionaire or not. So once he figures that out, we'll we'll let you know Jamal will be down was that, there was that Was the pun intended there, Fred? Because the Slumdog Millionaire character's name was also Jamal, just FYI. Yeah. So oh, I right. did not know. <laughs> I yeah. forgot about that. So that what was, a great movie. That was anyway. sort of a next-level pun right there, Fred. I mean, you know, pun, you're bringing, pun, you're bringing a, a Will Howard level of expertise to this show. Yes. Pun was completely intended. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate you guys. Hopefully we can get something set up, Ryan, for San Diego. We'll We'll do that off the air, but we appreciate you guys. If you guys see us now in San Diego, say hello. I'll be preaching that because it's coming up pretty soon now. We're a couple, we're about a week out. So a week out, 10 days. Yep, 10 days out. Nine we'll days. see you guys in San Diego. Nine, yeah, because today's 18th. We'll see you guys in San Diego. See us say hi. It's been fun. Great conversation, man. I love hanging out with you guys. You guys know how it goes. We'll see you next time. Live free, fight on. Mm-hmm.